is John Price, as I mentioned. I teach in the Department of History. And on behalf of the Neil Burton Commemorative Fund and the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives, I welcome you all to the second annual Neil Burton Commemorative Lecture. About 40 years ago, a young first year student at UBC stood up during a lecture on the atomic bomb and asked, but wasn't the bomb dropped to end the war and save the lives of allied soldiers? The lecturer at the front of the uh, lecture hall patiently explained that there might be a few problems with that explanation, and so began the re-education of one young Canadian. That was myself. And the lecturer at the front of the room was Neil Burton, then, in 1970, a graduate student at UBC. Neil went on to pursue his passion, which was the study of China. He lived and studied China for eight years, and then went to Japan, where he lived for 18 years, before returning to Canada to settle on Salt Spring Island. Neil never relinquished his passion for teaching about China and teaching about Japan, nor his passion for social justice. Thus, when we had the opportunity to bring Koko Kondo to speak here tonight, we felt it entirely appropriate that the Burton Fund should be involved in that project. Neil Burton died in May 2010, and to honor him and to pro promote his life's work advocating friendship between Asia and Canada, we decided to establish a commemorative fund to help sponsor lectures, conferences, and other socially progressive uh, endeavors um, and we hope that those of you who want to see this tradition continue will consider contributing to the Neil Burton Fund. All contributions uh, go to the University of Victoria uh, into the Neil Burton Fund and are tax deductible. And to, uh, to contribute, all you need to do is uh, write a check to the University of Victoria with a notation line saying Neil Burton Commemorative Fund. I'm very happy to introduce a number of Neil's relatives who are here with us tonight, having come from Vancouver and also uh, from Salt Spring Island, uh, where Neil lived uh, from uh, 1999 on. Uh, and uh, with us tonight uh, are uh, Neil's brother, uh, Donald Burton, and his partner, Cynthia. Would you like to... Neil's sister, Nancy Carter, and her husband, Dave, are also with us. And Neil's daughter, Barbara, is here as well. Barbie. And Neil's son, Jamie, is also with us. An event like tonight wouldn't have been possible without the support of many people, uh, including uh, Helen Lansdowne, the Associate Director of the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Helen had an accident and uh, has uh, uh, a broken uh, bone in her, uh, uh, her foot and was unable to join us tonight. But I want to recognize Cappy's support for this lecture uh, and to recognize some of the people from Cappy who are here, including Leanna, Robin and Heidi, uh, if you want to stand up and just to be acknowledged, is <laughs> I'd also like to uh, thank uh, uh, my colleague uh, Greg Blue and Chongping Chen, uh, who help administer the Neil Burton Fund. I think uh, Greg Blue is here, and Chongping Chen is unfortunately unable to make it tonight. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, Satoko Norimatsu. Uh, from Vancouver's Peace Philosophy Center, who has made it possible for Koko Kondo to be with us tonight. Satoko is an amazing person. Um, I've known her for a number of years, uh, first of all from Vancouver, where she helped organize the Article 9 Committee, which was a committee to promote the retention of the Peace Clause in the Japanese Constitution. Um, she's been very active in the anti-war movement, uh, very active in building solidarity uh, with people in Okinawa, uh, and uh, she is also um, a scholar in her own right, and she has uh, just recently uh, completed a book 
uh, with uh, Gavin McCormack, who spoke here at uh, uh, UVic a little while ago. Uh, the book is called No, Okinawa's Message to Japan and to the United States. Um, uh, I'd like you to offer a warm welcome to Sakuki Marinaki. We'll introduce our guest speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, uh, for such a kind um, introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed that there's so many uh, people here uh, uh, tonight uh, to be with us and to listen to uh, Koko's uh, talk. Um, my connection to Victoria goes back to um, 1982. I was a student of uh, Lester B. Pearson College. Uh, the, who, uh, how many of you here have heard of Lester B. Pearson College? Yeah, quite a number of you. I was a student there, um, grade 11, and not being able to speak English, and, uh, but it was an amazing uh, experience uh, learning uh, with people from hundred different countries and uh, I have a special guest, guest here today, the Miss uh, Diesa uh, Dolencio. <laughs> she, do, do wanna <laughs> she was a host mother and has hosted hundreds of uh, Pearson College students before and uh, she is still hosting me and I regard her as my uh, Canadian um, mother. And at that time I was um, I did have awareness of the importance of learning from history, for example, the history of atomic bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but I didn't know quite uh, what to do. And after almost 30 years, um, this is amazing to be uh, back in, in Victoria with uh, um, witness of Hiroshima, uh, Ms. Koko uh, Kondo, Year uh, 2012 uh, marks the 67th anniversary of the first nuclear weapons uh, dropped on the humanity on hundreds of thousands of women and men, old and young, mostly civilians, including tens of thousands of forced laborers from Korea, then colony of Japan. I believe the significance of learning about the history of nuclear weapons and nuclear power and its imp impact on people and environment is larger than ever now. I mean, the third nuclear crisis in Japan, which is ongoing since the fuel core meltdown in Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, plant on March 11th, 2011, and given the fact the world is still at the crossroads for survival or extinction, with over 20,000 nuclear warheads of which 95% are owned by Russia and the United States. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki Peace Study Tour uh, that Koko and I have been part of, uh, we bring American, Japanese, and other students to Hiroshima and Nagasaki each year. The tour is a joint initiative of the American University, Washington, D.C., and Litzmaker University uh, in Kyoto, Japan. The program was born in 19. 95, amid the controversy over the U.S. Uh, Smithsonian Institute National and, uh, Space and Air Museum planned exhibit of Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the Hiroshima bomb. The exhibit was going to include documentation of human effects of the bombing, including the ongoing suffering of the A-bomb survivors uh, decades after the war. The exhibit was canceled due to a heavy opposition uh, from the American Air Force Association and Veterans uh, Associations that was later hosted by the American University under Professor Peter Kuznick's uh, initiative. For 16 years uh, since then, Professor Kuznick and Professor Fujioka of Litzmeikan University have been bringing students from the US, Japan, China, Korea, and beyond uh, to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Koko, uh, she is a graduate of American University herself, joined the tour as guest speaker in 1996. And since 2006, I have been part of the tour as a translator and instructor. And since 2008, uh, with special invitation from the two universities, I've been bringing uh, Canadian students uh, to the tour. Uh, 
with a special arrangement. So if any of you are uh, interested in uh, joining our tour uh, this year, please uh, talk to me. Uh, Koko accompanies the tour as guest educator, and throughout the tour, she shares not just her experience as an atomic bomb survivor, but the spirit of peace and reconciliation, and most of all, her incredible energy and sense of humor and overflowing joy of life and love. Koko was an uh, eight months old baby when she was exposed to the Hiroshima atomic bomb on August 6, 1945, and only 1.1 kilometer away from the ground zero. In her town, no one else as young as she survived. Koko's story has been a highlight of our study tour program. Most of the American students who participated in the tour uh, have said meeting and getting to know Coco and her story has been the most inspiring and memorable part of the tour. I must also mention Coco's father, uh, Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto, who is one of the six survivors uh, interviewed in an essay and a book uh, published in 1946. Uh, it's called Hiroshima uh, by John Hersey. Uh, have any one of you have uh, heard of or read the book uh, John Hersey's uh, Hiroshima? Some of you, thank you. <coughs> and if you haven't, please uh, uh, look it up. The book was uh, written in 1946, so it was really the first book that uh, made uh, Americans aware of what happened, uh, not above, but underneath the Mushroom Club. And it was also uh, republished uh, in 1986, uh, 40 years afterwards, uh, to uh, describe, depict the, the lives of the six survivors. In 1999, the New York University Department of Journalism asked 36 experts that, to identify the best work of journalism of the 20th century, and they placed John Hersey's Hiroshima uh, at the top of their list. Mm. Reverend Tanimoto, being an atomic bomb survivor himself, spent sleepless days and nights helping the badly injured victims at a park in Hiroshima, now known as uh, Shukeyen Park. And during the study tour, we visit that park with Koko's guidance, as well as other places which carry the legacy of Reverend Tanimoto and his work. Reverend Tanimoto was also instrumental in a project called a Hiroshima Maiden Project, for which he, uh, uh, which he raised funds in order to bring young women of Hiroshima uh, with keloid scars on their face uh, to the United States for pl uh, plastic surgery. Uh, tonight, as a uh, part of uh, Coco's talk, we will show a part of 1955 TV program called This Is Your Life, uh, which, uh, in which Reverend Tanimoto appeared. And I wanted to show some of the photographs uh, of the tour. Uh, yeah. I can, um, oh, oh, okay, so, may, may I talk from here? I think I can talk uh, loud enough. And this is a group photo in front of the Hiroshima atomic bomb dome, and, oh, I think the order of the photo has been mixed up. This is Nagasaki, we visit the both uh, cities. And we hear a number of Hibakusha uh, w uh, atomic bomb survivors uh, during the tour. And this is Mr. Taniguchi, uh, one of the most well-known uh, atomic bomb survivors uh, from uh, Nagasaki. Uh, he was, oh, I think, okay, maybe I can go backwards. Wait. Okay, the program starts in, in Kyoto. Uh, we visit uh, temples and, and shrines. Um, somehow the, the order gets mixed up, maybe. I'll just show um, all the photos and get you the idea of what the program, what the tour is about. Um, so uh, the Hiroshima uh, uh, baseball game, we usually go at the end of the, um, August uh, 6th. And this is the uh, Hiroshima uh, A-bomb uh, cenotaph, uh, where about the uh, 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 50,000 people gather to uh, remember the victims of the bombing on uh, the morning of August 6th, and uh, we 
and all the American students attend the ceremony. And uh, Coco is um, a, a very popular uh, person in the tour, and this is one of the American students, uh, former Marine, uh, massaging uh, her <laughs> shoulder. <laughs> And uh, uh, this is Mr. Taniguchi, and he was badly injured. You might have seen uh, one of these photos. Uh, that's him, and he survived the worst uh, ban on his uh, uh, back, and he was uh, bedridden for two years. Uh, so um, he still suffers you know, uh, uh, from uh, numerous diseases and has had to go through uh, uh, dozens of operations. And this is in Nagasaki. We go to uh, we visit an elementary school where uh, hundreds of uh, students and and, and uh, uh, teachers fell victims of the bombing. And this is uh, Coco again with some boys from the program. <laughs> and uh, yep, a bomb dome. And Coco uh, explains uh, in front of the a bomb dome. And this is inside the Hiroshima uh, peace. Memorial Museum, again, uh, Coco explains where everything uh, was in a diorama of the Hiroshima city uh, then. And uh, this is a very special guest that we had last year, uh, Mr. Gen, uh, no, 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 Gen, <laughs> Keiji Nakazawa. Uh, I wonder, some of you have heard of uh, his uh, classic manga uh, uh, masterpiece called uh, Barefoot Gen, Hadashi no Gen. How many of you have heard of that work? Well, quite many of you. Actually, more than John Hersey's <laughs> <in Russia. laughs> And uh, he was our guest speaker um, uh, last year. It was very uh, special. And this is a Shukeyen Park that I talked about where Koko's father, Reverend Hanimoto, helped uh, 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 survivors. A beautiful Japanese garden. If you get a chance to visit Hiroshima, uh, you should visit uh, this a park and a baseball game and at the end of that uh, day we do this um, lantern ceremony uh, to commemorate uh, hundreds of uh, victims who um, who would be floating you know the, the, a lot of you know, bodies floating on this river really uh, covering the whole surface of the river uh, on August 6 and following days and um, to conclude uh, my introduction, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, two messages from uh, two past uh, American uh, students who participated the tour. In Vancouver, we had some uh, Canadian past students, but uh, we don't have anybody uh, uh, today. So I wanted to read uh, uh, two messages from the past uh, American students, and one is from Tammy uh, Mueller. She uh, participated uh, from St. Louis, uh, Missouri. I have had the privilege to travel with Coco and hear her story twice now and have been truly grateful for the experience. She's an ex exceptionally strong person for sharing and reliving her powerful story year after year. Anyone who takes part in listening to her story will remember it vividly for the rest of their lives, as I know I will. Any Hibakusha's atomic bomb survivor's tale is something you will never forget and be privileged to listen to. And I hope you'll be as grateful as to Coco as I am for sharing it uh, yet again uh, from Tammy. And there's another one uh, from uh, Vini Intondi. He's a professor of history at Seminole College in South uh, Florida. The first time I went to Japan was in 2005 as a graduate student at American University. Of course, I had read John Hersey's Hiroshima and knew of Coco. Throughout the entire trip, Coco spent time with all of the students and we also heard her testimony. However, her true impact on me began the night of August 6th. That night, the students all attended a lunch ceremony in Hiroshima. It was at this moment that everything hit me. All I had read, heard, seen up to this point. All the anger, guilt, sadness boiled over. I began sobbing uncontrollably with my peace family, repeating over and over, I am sorry, I am sorry. As we began to leave the area, Coco spotted me from a distance and realized how upset I was. She came over and consoled me. We walked together and she told me, these Japanese students will never forget you and how you reacted. You have no idea 
the impact you're making. When you return to the States, you just need to reach people one at a time. That's all you can do, just one at a time. I never forget those words. Now, seven years later, I'm no longer a student, but a professor who brings my own students on the Japan trip. Every time I step into a classroom, every time I speak to a friend or a relative, every time I give a speech, I think about Coco's words, just reach one person at a time. I hope I have and will always continue to do so because of her. She is a remarkable human being and someone I am so proud to call my friend. Coco, I'm already making you cry before you even speak. Please well, welcome Miss Coco Kondo. I'm so short lady. I hope you can see. Excuse me, can I take off my jacket? I'm just so, you know, came out my tears, so sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Neil Burgess and Burgess family. I appreciate it. I'm just so delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Satoko just mentioned about the John Hersey's Hiroshima. He wrote this book, 1946, and six main characters in this book. Yes. Then, 40 years after he published this book, but oh, I better say one more thing. John Hersey was uh, growing up in China because uh, his parents, a missionary in China. So he knows uh, Orient so much, and uh, for him, Japan is something is very dear to him because Japan is very close to uh, uh, China. So he wrote this uh, first in New Yorker magazine. Then New Yorker magazines were, the later is published this book. Forty years after this book was published, he wrote Aftermath, what's happened after the, this book was published. And today, when you, want, you see this book, it's all added together with first section and Aftermath in one book. I am in the uh, Aftermath under the name Coco. And, uh, but uh, like, uh, for example, the day I graduated from college, the date is not, you know, correct. But he was already, you know, some, well, uh, 70 some years old, so I didn't complain anything about that <laughs> because I'm not the important person in this book. Main person is these six people. But I just wanted to say one thing to uh, John Hersey since I was a little girl. So I said, Mr. Hersey, I would like to say the one thing. He said, what, Coco? Just say it. So I said, Mr. Hersey, I am not a boy. I am a girl. <laughs> this is, you know, to me, this is very important. Because, because the, maybe I should, I should read what he said. After I said that, John Hersey said, Coco, do you have a book? So yes. Sir, I have a book, and I brought it to him, and he said, he took the pen and he wrote, For Koko Tanimoto, who stands out in this book as an arrow, he underlined it. In, uh, underlined, you know, arrow. For which, my apologies, page 41, warm wishes, John so of course I have to open up the you know page forty one. So I did it, and uh, oh, I will never forget that moment. He crossed out in front, son, son out, and he put the daughter. 
<laughs> so today, when you find me in this book, it's infant daughter. <laughs> so I'm very happy with the, he corrected, you know, now. <laughs> August 6, 1945. According to many people, that morning was a clear day. The air rate was off, so children and people get out from the, you know, shelter. And that morning, I was 1.1 kilometer away from Grand Zero. Then for many years, I just couldn't ask my parents what's happened to me or what's happened to my mother. Because if I ask that question, they have to recall that day. And as a daughter, I can feel, you know, that's a very, very painful thing to recall that day. So that's why I just couldn't ask them in person. But I had a chance to read, you know, his book, or, you know, I heard his lectures or speeches, and I gathered the information in little by little. However, when I was 40 or something, 45, one day my mother said, Coco, I'm going to tell you what's happened on that day. As I told you, we, my mother and myself, we were in the parsonage, about 1.1 kilometer away from Grand Zero. <coughs> I know it's very difficult to see the map, but this is the city of Hiroshima. The city was, you know, the Hiroshima city is in the delta. And this is all the mountain. And 1.1 kilometers around here. And this whole red part is the fire <coughs> and burn every, you know, thing. She was inside the, you know, church parsonage. And usually eight months old baby is crawling on the tatami mattress room. But that morning, was the air raid was off, and one of the church members visited my mother. So she picked me up, and she had me in her arm, and started talking to the lady. 8.15, the whole house crushed. According to my mother, she was hit by the so many, you know, words and uh, the uh, roof. Uh, so she was unconscious. But once in a while the consciousness, you know, comes back. And at first she said she heard some baby's crying voice. Oh, some baby crying. Then suddenly, no sound whatsoever. And just dark, black, you know, place. Then her consciousness came back little by little. She realized the very voice was not somebody's baby. It was her baby. It was me inside of her arm. But since my mother was top of me, so I could not breathe anymore. So if my mother's consciousness didn't come up, back, then probably we were died inside the house. But it's because, you know, this, uh, uh, I was crying, but suddenly no sound. Then her consciousness came back, the mother's instinct. She knew she had to do something. So of course she asked for help. Help, help us, we were here. But of course, no one came. Then. She did see the small light coming through the roof. And of course, the Methodist minister's wife, she asked for God, please help us. But don't worry about me, but just help this baby, my daughter. I don't care about my life, but my daughter's life. Please, God, help this baby to live. 
since no one came to help us, so she knew she had to do something. So she moved little by little. Finally, she was able to make a little hole. First, she put me out, and she got out from the house. When she was out and looking at the uh, neighborhood, it's all different. Nothing. And fires all over the place, and of course, our house was start uh, burning. So she just took me and start walk toward to the hill. In Hiroshima, we have uh, seven rivers at that time, and uh, many bridges were all, you know turned down and broke, and we could not use it. But since my mother has a little baby, Coco, many people said, go first, go first, and we were able to go to this, not the Whittier Mountain, it's more like a hill. My father's church, located in the middle of the city, about uh, 800 meters away from Grand Zero, after the disaster, people come to church one by one. Our church, uh, before the World War II, might be a uh, mm, uh, hundred people, you know, but it's getting you know the smaller and smaller size, and then about seventy to eighty percentage of the church member passed away. But after the, this disaster, one by one, people come into church. They are not Christian, and they are not looking for their religion, but they want something to fulfill the, this feeling of the sadness. I will never forget the young ladies, since I was a little girl, to me, they are my, uh, you know, uh, big sisters. They are teenagers, age 20, you know, those girls came into the church. They call me Koko-chan. Chan is for the, you know, little uh, children. So they call me Koko-chan, Koko-chan. They treat me, treated me like their sisters. Some of them took the comb and combed my hair. I look at their hand, all the fingers are melted together, just like you know, this way. It's, you know, they were so sweet, so I wanted to see their faces. But as a child, their faces are so ugly, so scary face. Every one of them, as a little girl, I just couldn't understand why those girls have the same kind of face. I couldn't ask them, but I gathered the information little by little, and I found out. They are all the burning by the one bomb was dropped in Hiroshima City. It's because they are so sweet. I thought, all right, when I grow up, I am going to find someone who are on the B-29 in Oregon. I am going to give them a, you know, revenge. I'm going to punch them or kick them or maybe I should bite them because I'm a good person. But I thought as a child, the people who are on the B-29 and all are like, they're the bad one. So I said, someday, someday I'm going to do it. And I couldn't that, tell that to my parents because my father is, you know, a minister. And if I tell that, I knew it. He's going to give me a big, you know, uh, <laughs> a speech about what is right and what is, you know, 
uh, wrong. So I said, I better not tell anything to my father or mother. But I kept it deep in myself. Someday, I'm the one who have to do something. Then, but, uh, when I was uh, six, seven, eight years old, the children, little, about my age, comes to church. Uh, I didn't know first why they came to church. And I found out they are the orphans. Some of them are sleeping on the street. Through the Hiroshima Peace Center and through the Saturday Review magazine, asked for the people to help those orphans, writing a letter <coughs> supporting uh, Murray. So, sending Christmas pre Christmas card or a birthday card. But those children cannot read English letters. That's why the children brought those letters into church. And whoever could read the English letter translated into Japanese. So, those children came to the church to pick up those letters. They go home and write in thank you and they brought. So that's why the, I did see uh, many children come in and out. I have my parents, but not them. I feel so you know, bad, and I learned it's because one bomb was dropped in Hiroshima City, that's why they lost everything. They lost the mother, they lost the father, brother and sister, uncle, and you know, everything, even their treasures. That's why I said, same thing. Someday, someday I will not. I am going to revenge the people. As a child, I thought the people who were on the B-29 in Oregon, they are the bad one. I am the good person. 1955, my father escorted 25 girls who went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York for plastic surgery. Next day, we received a telephone call from the United States. Well, at that time, we didn't have a telephone, so one of the missionary received the telephone. It was from an NBC, and they said to my mother, please come to the United States tomorrow. But do not tell anyone, especially to your husband. I didn't know what's going on, but the money, we didn't have any money, so my mother took the uh, plane to Tokyo. And myself and my brother, we had to take a sleeper train. We went to Tokyo, and we left that day to the United States. The one day, well, a few days after that, you know, that day, I will never forget. We went to studio. I could recognize some of my father's friends because my father went to uh, Emory University in Atlanta uh, as a you know, theological seminary student before World War II. So um, his classmates were on the bus, you know, there. And the one with the missionary who were in Japan, I could recognize it. But one man I never met before. But I was already 10 years old. And think about your 10 years old. Very curious 10 years old. You have to know everything. Very nosy, well, my case, my very nosy girl. So I had to know everything. So I asked my mother, who is that man over there? But she didn't tell me right away, because she wasn't sure how I would take. But she thought about it. Coco is 10 years old. She should know what's going on in this world. Then she said, Coco, the man over there, his name is Captain Robert Lewis, who was a co-pilot of the Enora game. I was so shocked, because my dream was I wanted to meet those persons someday 
much later in my life. But only 10 years old, what can I do? <laughs> then I'm not the stupid to go run to the you know, stage and give him a punch in, you know, but I know that's not the right thing to do. The little Coco can do the only one thing, just open up my eye and stare at him. You are the bad one. I am the good one. The program went on. I will never forget the moment. My father and Kiko <coughs> Lewis were standing in the mirror. Ralph Edward, the interview was standing. Then, as a child, I was just watching and opened up my eyes as much as, as I could. Then, staring at him, I remember that Ralph Edward said, how did you feel? after the, you dropped the bar. He said, they dropped the bomb in Hiroshima. They had to leave because you know, strong wind and easily to, you know, to crash. So they knew they had to leave there. But they had order to go back to the you know, city to see how the result of the bomb which they dropped. Captain Lewis said, after they went back to Hiroshima and saw the Hiroshima city from the air. My God, what have we done? This is the issue of the Time magazine of 1985. Took his words. My God, what have we done? As I told you, I was telling you to get eye because I thought he was the bad one. After he said that, little Coco really saw his tears came out from his eyes. I felt so bad. I didn't know anything about this guy. But until that morning, I thought he was the bad one. And I thought if he never dropped that bomb, I thought people in Hiroshima didn't have to suffer. That tear changed my whole view. Before I saw that his tears, I only, only thought about people in Hiroshima sorrow. I never ever thought about people in the United States or people who are on the airplanes. Never. But that tear changed my feeling. As a ten years ago, when I saw his tears, I said to him, gee. Sometimes I have a fight with my brothers and sisters. Boy, I have so many bad, you know, feeling inside of myself. I shouldn't hate this guy. If I hate, I should hate war itself, not this person. Until the, you know, I was crying the, you know, that end of that show. After the show, the little Coco could do the only one thing, just walk to the Captain Lewis, stand next to him, side by side, and I softly touched his hand. He hold my hand very tightly. And you know, that big hand, even if I recall now, I can feel. And I'm so thankful that I met him. Otherwise, probably, I have this feeling of hatred for all my life. Well, I cry too much, so I need a little break. So, <laughs> Baby, would you please show that, you know, this is, this is your life? for a moment. Thank you.
this is only a you know part of this you know this is your life show. started your story on August 6, 1945. Now, because of the nature of our This Is Your Life program tonight, our wonderful sponsor, Hazel Bishop, has asked that we omit our commercial at this time, so we'll not interrupt our story. We're very grateful to our, our wonderful sponsor for this wonderful gesture. Now, back to This Is Your Life, Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto in Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. still as our earth shakes to an explosion never before equal. In a daze, you pull yourself from your position between the two garden rocks. From your vantage point, you again look out over the city. You started to tell us what you saw. What did you see? Well, I saw the uh, whole city on fire. And uh, many people uh, running away from the city in, the, uh, in silence. Uh, their skin peeling off, not hanging from face, from arm, but strange to say, in sounds, it looked uh, like a procession of ghosts. Did you know that Hiroshima had been the first city to feel the force of atomic power? Well, I didn't know what happened. But as your mind clears, you think of your wife and baby, your church, your parishioners, all somewhere in the enveloping dust. You start to run toward the city, saying, my God, help them. And looking down from thousands of feet over Hiroshima, all I could think of was, my God, what have we done? The voice again of a man whose second of eternity was woven up with yours, Reverend Tanimoto. Now, you've never met him, have never seen him, but he's here tonight to clasp your hand in friendship. Captain Robert Lewis, United States Air Force, who along with Paul Tibbetts piloted the plane from which the first atomic power was dropped over Hiroshima. <laughs> Captain Lewis, come in here, close, and would you tell us, sir, of your experience on August 6, 1945? Well, Mr. Edwards, uh, we left uh, Tinian in the Mariana Islands at about 8, uh, 2.45 in the morning on August the 6th, 1945. Our destination was Japan. We had three targets. One was Hiroshima, one was Nagasaki, one was Kokura. About an hour before we uh, hit the coastline of Japan, we were notified that Hiroshima was clear. Therefore, Hiroshima became our target. Just before 8.15 a.m. Tokyo time, Tom Ferby, a very able bombardier, carefully aimed at his target, which was the second Imperial Japanese Army headquarters. 8.15, promptly, the bomb was dropped. We turned fast to get out of the way of the deadly radiation and bomb effects. First was a big flash that we got, and then the two concussion waves hit the ship. Shortly after, we turned back to see what had happened. And there in front of our eyes, the city of Hiroshima disappeared. Now you entered something in your log at that time. As I said before, Mr. Edwards, I wrote down later 
My God, what have we done? And so, Reverend Tanimoto, you on the ground, and you on your military mission, Captain Lewis, in the air, both appeal to a power greater than your own. Thank you, Captain Robert Lewis, now personnel manager of Henry Hyde Incorporated in New York City. In that split second when one atom bomb was exploded, 100,000 people were either killed or destined to die. 100,000 more were hurt. Were you hurt, Reverend Tommy Moto? I was safe. But as you run along the highway into the city in search of your wife and baby, you're stunned by the human destruction which you see. Now, you've told us pretty much about this, Reverend Tommy Moto. You've told us about what you saw. Fires have sprung up everywhere. Your way into the city is blocked. You keep running, trying to get to your home, your church. You apologize to people along the way because you are unhurt. <laughs> yes, Reverend Tanimoto, it's true from your home in Hiroshima, which you just left to surprise you, even as she did on August 6th, is your wife, Chisaka Tanimoto. Here she is. <laughs> I think we really surprised your husband. Where were you when the bomb fell? What did your wife say? Uh, I'm fucked up. I was there under the debris. Yes. Uh, holding uh, uh, my baby Coco in, in my arms. Yes, no completely dazed. You're able to extricate yourself, Mrs. Tanimoto, and you make your way through the streets until by a miracle you bump right into your husband. Now, Reverend Tanimoto, there follow days and nights of help, administration to the wounded. You carry on, you comfort, you bring water to the thirsty, unable to move, you run for whatever medical help you can get. More often than not, unable to find it, you bring back rice cakes and biscuits instead. It's a week before news begins to leak out from official Japanese headquarters that the city had been destroyed by the energy released by the splitting of an atom. And then, Nagasaki feels the terror of the second bomb. And on August 15th, the Emperor of Japan broadcasts to the nation that the war is over. And out of the carnage that was Hiroshima at 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, the Japanese people have built a new city. But ten years later, all is not forgotten. There are still very visible signs of that terrible day which stand as living reminders of what atomic power can do. Dr. Green, you had something to say to us about this. Tony Moto decided to do something about that, Mr. Edwards. Organize some help for these girls who had been students together and whose bodies had been badly disfigured and maimed and he felt that to bring them to the United States was where they could get plastic surgery and help them uh, alleviate some of their suffering. Yes. Isn't it true, uh, Dr. Green, uh, that uh, much medical uh, research is being done by our own government as well as the uh, Japanese government at Hiroshima? Yes, that's quite true, but that research has taken the direction of diagnosis rather than of actual treatment to bring about recovery. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Green. So with the help of a committee composed of such people as Norman Cousins, John Hersey, Pearl Buck, uh, Dr. Green here and others, the Hiroshima Peace Center Associates is formed. What is its purpose, Reverend Tanimoto? To help uh, social rehabilitation of Hiroshima. I see. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Monday, May 9th, 25 girls from Hiroshima arrived in New York City via U.S. Army transport. They're being treated surgically at Mount Sinai Hospital at absolutely no cost. Tonight, we would like you to meet two of these girls. Both have lived through the terror of an atomic bombing. To avoid causing them any embarrassment, we'll not show you their faces. May I present Mr. Koya Minowa and Ms. Tadaka Emori. They said they're happy to be in America. Yes. Thank the United States for what they're doing now for them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have more to say about this important project in the next few moments. I know that uh, if you want to relax for just a moment, uh, 
Mr. Tani Moto, one more joyful surprise for you. Your children, Coco, Ken, Jun, and Finn, and here. All the way from Hiroshima. Come on, Ken, Jun, and Finn. This is your life, Kiyoshi Tani Moto, a man of God who looked into the face of eternity in that awful moment when the world stood still, and who is now courageously building a monument to peace out of the ashes of Hiroshima. In a moment, Reverend Tanamoto, we we'll look into your future, which you, ladies and gentlemen, can share. But first, here's Bob Warren. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how many of you You don't talk enough about Hazel Bishop nail polish. Well, tonight, I want you to meet one of our enthusiastic Hazel Bishop users, Mrs. Arthur Johnson of St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Mrs. Johnson. Hello, Mr. Warren. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> but, you know, this show was, you know, great help to the people in Hiroshima because the, this program asked for donation. And, uh, of course, 25 girls at the Mount, Mount Sinai, you know, got a free treatment. But there were so many people in Japan. And uh, so, the doctors escorted the 25 girls, so they learned some of the operation. Then after, they, uh, the doctor go back to Japan and start helping other uh, people. I would like to explain more about this Captain Lewis. Of course, after this show, he was called by the Pentagon, and they really gave him a hard time. When I was a sophomore year in the United States as a college student, one day I really wanted to see Captain Lewis again because I thought I would like to tell him thank you. Because of you, the little Coco changed the whole view. And uh, that's why. I just wanted to see you to tell them. I asked my father's friends and tried, they tried to search him. Then I found out he was at the mental hospital. And I was a poor student. I didn't have enough money to go over. And I felt so sorry, but I did not take any action to go over to say the one word that little Coco appreciated you. Five years and a half of my college education in the United States, I went back to Japan. One day I opened up the newspaper, said he passed away. I regret, I regret that I did not take the action when I was a sophomore in college, to, all, to go over to him to say the word. But at the same time, when I was reading that newspaper, I felt in Hiroshima, at the Peace Park, there's a cenotaph. In the cenotaph, as an inscription said, let's all the souls hear rest in peace, for we shall not repeat the evil. I would like to give that word to Captain Lewis. Year or two years after he passed away, the one who psychotherapist showed it the sculpture which he made it at the hospital. One mushroom crowd and one tear. So today you're here, you can understand how he felt. Well, this, uh, this is your life, you know, brought me to the United States and uh, usually, you know, go home right away. But Pearl Buck, since she was the board of director, she said, my father had to give the lecture, you know, all over the United States. So she suggested, Maybe we could stay, my mother and the four of us children, 
could stay at her house in Bucks County in Pennsylvania. We stayed there for three months. It was wonderful three months. But while I was there, I learned two things. One, she's a beautiful Caucasian lady. Of course, she grew up in China. So even as a child, I could feel from her, she has a East, you know, taste, which are from, you know, Orient, and West from, you know, she's a Caucasian lady. She had a beautiful East and West inside of, you know, herself. Oh, as a 10 years old girl, I thought, oh, someday I would like to be like her. When we were at the, her guest house, I saw the beautiful picture. It was her child. That's what I learned from my mother. She has a, this daughter. It's the only one daughter she gave a birth. From the birth, she was a mentally handicapped. She said to me, when I was a college student, she said, Coco, Usually, mentally handicapped children could not do anything for society. That's what the people said, and that's what the society says. But that's not true. No one maybe made me the Nobel uh, Prize winner, except my daughter. The people said, my daughter could not do anything for society. But my daughter is the one sent me to the, this world. That means, Coco, remember, each child who are born in this world has to me. So remember that. Another thing, one more thing, while I was in college in the United States, she, whenever I have a chance to talk to her, one by one, she said to me, Coco, if the war started, many people suffer. But remember, the children suffer the most. I am so grateful. That is a good lesson I got it from Pro S. Buck. Okay, I'm sorry, back to the 1955, you know, after this, you know, this is your life show. I went back to Japan, then finished the sixth grade and went to junior high. <coughs> I went to Noborimachi Junior High School, where the Sadako Sasaki, do you know this name? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the name? Who is Sadako? Sadako died of cancer and she made a thousand cranes in mm. hopes to live. Yes, mm. thank you. I went to the same school, but when I entered the school, she was already passed away. Mm. But uh, the teachers told us so many times, the student body, we gathered, uh, you know, uh, uh, collect the money from all over the Japan, and we made the uh, statue in Hiroshima. Until last year, I didn't know that. I thought I never ever met Sadako. But guess what? She was attending my father's ch church kindergarten. So I used to play <laughs> with her. But I didn't know until last year I found out. <laughs> this uh, my uh, junior high school years. I had a very bad uh, experience that I don't want it to tell <coughs> to anyone. But nowadays, I want to tell, especially to the young people, to the students. And today, you know, there's a boys too, but I hope you can understand my feeling of the, my puberty age. Since I was a little girl, Hiroshima and Nagasaki had an atomic bomb 
Treasury Commission, ABCC, run by the U.S. government at that time. It's not the hospital, it's a research center. Because the whole world was so curious how the radiation affected the human body. So check the children, how the child, you know, child grown up. So even today, they have a very thick data of Koko Tanimoto. However, when I was little, I was happy to go up there because after a long day of testing, <coughs> they will provide a nice lunch and they don't, it was a good, you know, memory. Except my seventh or eighth or ninth grade, I don't really remember. Whenever I go to ABCC, they will provide a nice basket. Inside the basket, they have a cotton gown and cotton looks like a pumpers. I had to change to that and go to room to room for the checkup. That day, the doctor said, Miss Tanimoto, go to such and such room. I didn't ask what kind of test or anything, but I just said hi, went there. It was auditorium. Yes, it was a size like this, but no windows. And they have a spotlight, it was so strong. Ceiling was much, you know, higher. The spotlight was so strong, I couldn't see many people inside. But I could hear this, all the languages before starting the meeting. The English, French, German, there were so many different languages. So I can guess right away, oh, this mis must be the doctor's meeting. Doctor told me to go up the stage, so I did. Doctor said, stand up in the middle of the stage. So I did. Back of me, it was 10 centimeter square line. So from the audience, could see right away how tall I am, how wide I am. Then the doctor said, Miss Tanimoto, please take off your gown. Take off a gown? I only have a little tiny, I, even I had to take off my, uh, you know, Underwear, and they will provide a little cut, cotton thing, tie in both sides. That's only thing. Well, today's young girls, you wear them bikini swimming suits, so maybe you don't have any feeling, you know, funny feeling. But like me, you know, it was so awkward to wear that. It stuck in the middle of the of people with almost naked. Oh, I was so furious. I look up the city, and of course I'm a preacher's daughter. I ask for God, for him, please help me to take me away right away. But he's not listening to my <laughs> prayer. <laughs> then I look at the city. All right, if no one is going to help me. I was so mad at the Japanese doctor, too. If he's the same Japanese person, why well, he could help me to take away from this situation. And I, I, maybe it wasn't that long, but to me it was a long time. Puberty age, it was so difficult. Look at the scene, my tears. Goes to my cheek, go down to my breast, and go to the two legs. And I said, all right. This is the end of Hiroshima. I'd like to say goodbye to Hiroshima. I don't want to stay in this city. I'm, as long as I live, I'm not going to tell anyone that I was in Hiroshima. You know, especially puberty age, it was just so painful, so furious. Yes, August 6, 1945, I was in Hiroshima. But I didn't start the war, and why do I have to do that? That night, I couldn't tell that to my parents, my brothers, and my friends. It was deep in myself for a long, long, long time. So when I was a student in the United States, of course I didn't tell them. very difficult to recall that day's, you know, moment. But I really wanted to know 
the how the children went through it. Even I don't have any carol outside from outside, but my heart is really hurt. Last year I was in the, uh, the National Geographic on TV. Then the doctor said, my mother was able to bear the three other children after me, but not me. Because uh, my mother and myself, we actually received the same dosage of uh, radiation. But my mother was already formed her body as an adult. But me, I was still eight months old. Baby. So my doctor said that, that even on the TV, the doctor said, might be cocoa infected. Well, this, you know, hard ABCC uh, uh, thing. I was in the United States. My senior year in college, after my scholarship, I knew I had to go home, back to Japan, back to Hiroshima. But it's because of that, I don't want to go back to Hiroshima. So I thought, good idea. I should marry to somebody in the United States so I don't have to go back to Hiroshima. <laughs> I thought I was a brilliant too, very good, A plus thinking. <laughs> But my engagement was cut off because my fiance's uncle was a medical doctor. His specialty was how the radiation affected the human body. Whole family said, Coco is no good. That's why I had to go I was really hurt, you know, that time. But today, may I think that? That was nothing. Still, the most painful one is when I had to stand up in the middle of the doctor with the almost you know, naked. That was the most difficult situation for me. When my engagement was called off, I was, you know, sad, but at the same time, I was little, what should I say? Not the happy, but the, I could say, oh, finally I could understand that all the girls who used to come to my father's church with all disfigured girls when I was a little, I met them. Those girls told me so many stories. It's because of this appearance, my fiance decided to not to marry. Or a boyfriend said, because of the caroid, let's call off. I heard so many such stories. So when I heard that time, I'm different from those girls. But when my engagement would call off, Finally, I understood their real sadness. Well, time is really coming, so I better rush and finish it. Well, so, well, nowadays, I go around the, you know, many countries with the many children because of Probak. Probak told me when I was a little, when the war started, remember, children suffered the most. So, of course, First Gulf War, two weeks before that, I went there with American teenagers, went to Baghdad, because those children wanted to see the present to say. We couldn't see him because war was too close, but we were able to see the first deputy prime minister. And we really want children, the teenager wanted that the what kind of world the children wanted. They really sp spoke out. Or five years ago at the uh, Russia, Bethlehem, the school was attacked by the terrorists. 
I was just so furious that the terrorists used the children as a target. I could not sit on my church uh, parsonage. I could not speak uh, Russian, but I thought I could stand next to those children. So after four months, I went there. The 300 people, you know, 300 some people, the children died, but the children who were able to survive, oh, they were really, they could not go back to school. They were just, you know, lost, sort of, you know, the mentality. I, the only thing I could say to those children, I'm sorry. I'm the one person who are living in this world as adults, and I'm sorry I couldn't, I didn't help you. Today here, ah, many of the students, thank you very much, but I would like to ask you in the student, a few questions. Number one, in Hiroshima, we have a, a as I told you, it's in the Delta, seven rivers, uh, you know, the running. When you have a little, Bird on your finger. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Run jump to the water. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not only a, you know Canadian or American. You know, we do it. Okay. Think that one you want. Okay. Then I have another question. When you have a cut and go to the ocean, what's going to happen? This uh, stings. 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 Yes, very stings. Think about it. Many survivors didn't tell me for a long time. They were burned, so they went to the river. Mm -hmm. When in Hiroshima, low tide, it was okay, because water <coughs> coming from mountain go down to the seven rivers. But when it comes to the high tide, inland sea water go up the river. There were so many people they couldn't describe that because of it was a too painful thing. So wherever August 6th, go to a uh, lantern floating night, which you saw it on the you know, slide, my heart is just ah, so painful. And I wonder, you know, I have to recall those people's feelings. OK, I have another question to the college student. Do you understand your father well? <laughs> I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Do you have a good relationship with your father? No. Yes, no? <laughs> okay, I have to tell you, I'm very, you know, shaped. I just couldn't understand my father for many, many, many years because he was helping people who survived, the survival of Hiroshima. Because at the church, we have, you know, Japanese, but there is Korean. But for him, it's the people is, he's concerning more, not his children. When he go to a lecture in Tokyo or Osaka, that's okay. But well, if he goes to the United States, he would not come home for years, two years. I am his daughter, which John Hersey finally <laughs> said so. I'm a daughter. I needed my father's attention when I was little. He was always out. He was always thinking about all other survivors. And, and wherever I read the newspaper or magazines, many of the magazines or newspaper mention about my father a bad guy because he educated in the United States and he's a Christian and uh, so they said he's a communist. I don't know how that tied together. <laughs> However, that's what the news said. And he helped only uh, girls, not the poor. 
But when I read, read those newspapers as a child, it hurt me. My father is that bad guy, you know. He served at the Nagarika Church for 39 years and 11 months. That was almost 40 years. Since I was a little girl, he always said, Coco, you were able to live through it. So please work for peace. They said, oh, you're a strong person. You don't have to get married. You can live, you know, <laughs> by yourself. Well, he said, uh-uh, no. I don't want to you know. I would like to walk toward to his wishes. Last sermon he gave at the church, he said, the 1945 August 6, he, it's John versus Hiroshima described, but at, at the church we have a, you know, big, many Bible and hymns and piano. And he cannot take those things to the countryside because at that time in Japan, all the family, as a family goods, were put in the countryside so they can, you know, avoid for the, from the fire. So he had to help his friends to help those church belonging. But August 6th, that morning, his friends' household goods were put in the uh, hill of the coin. My father get up early and go through the center of the city when he reached the hill. He was hit by the strong wind. First, he didn't know anything about it. He fell down on the ground. Gradually, he got up, touched the body. It was okay. No, nothing was, you know, injured. So he walked toward the edge of the hill. From there, he could see the whole city, the fire, and people started, you know, coming out from the city. He didn't know what's happened, but he said, he was so concerned about his daughter, his wife, his church member, his neighbors. So he walked toward to the center of the city. Many people asked for help, help, help. He tried to help, but people who were caught under the house, he could not help by himself. Or person inside the house is have already fire started. The person inside the house said, don't worry about me. <coughs> go, go away. You have to escape. So he had to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And went into the center of the city. He said, being a minister, wanted to serve for the people. But that day, I only thought about my daughter, my wife, my church member, my neighbor. He said that's a self-centric, egocentric thing. The resentment put him to the peace world. That's why he said he worked for peace. Finally, I understood and gee, he's a good guy. <laughs> I am so glad that I am his daughter. I cannot do anything like he did. But after 60 years from the, that day, people asked me to write the book. So finally, I published the book. For many years, I don't remember the August 6, 1945. So I said, no, no, I'm not the right person to speak out or write. But people said, well, Coco, you went through too. So that's why I took my turn. Mommy, you're worrying about my uh, you know, marriage life. So I better tell you that you have to get a you know, good night's sleep. So I will tell you, <laughs> age 30. Finally, I decided to get married. But I don't want a Christian to marry the Christian. 
because I saw my father. So I started dating atheist. <laughs> <laughs> and he was making a documentary movie. So I thought, oh, he may have a money. Not like in a minister's family. This is what I bought. I would like to start my new life. This man, he became a minister. Uh, he made a Christian, and later he became a minister. <laughs> so now I live in the second floor of the church. So today's young people, you plan something, sometimes do work. But that's all right. That's all right. It's lead to, you know, might be better. For oh, I learned so many things from so many people. And the, especially I learned great things from the children. And if you don't mind, I, many children of the world, it doesn't matter it's a religion, but this prayer, the many children's life, so I would like to read and end my speech. Lord, may make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be unconsoled uh, as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in given that we be It is in power that we are part of, and it is, it is in time that we are born. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Give me a one minute. My blessed one minute. August 6, 1945. This is a dress I was wearing. And I'm so grateful to my mother. She kept it for a long time. And I want each child who was born in this world. I want to, you know, live through. And I don't want any adult to cut off the light which they were given from the beginning. Thank you. <laughs>